I feel safe to tell my whole story in road because it's consideration of people's trauma is part of the practice. I've gone to quite a few different road meetings and they all have had the same calm energy. I think of it as Buddha energy. There can be tears in meetings and there's no shame. Road is a safe space and I needed that type of energy in my life. 12 steps was the opening, but now there are different and deeper dimensions of recovery, and Road did that for me. One thing our practice has helped me with is my reactivity. Because of my daily meditation practice and the teachings of the four noble truths and eightfold path, I can take a pause before reacting to something that makes me angry. I am still a work in progress, but I know that I'm not in the street anymore and I don't have to protect myself like that. The wise one says to listen and be still. I know I'm getting better. Because someone said something unwise to me the other day, and I didn't say anything. I just gave them a look over my glasses. Recovery Dharma has helped me have compassion for myself and others. This has helped me receive love and care from other Payo. Dash. PLE. Something I haven't been used to. While I don't live the Four Noble Truths in the Eightfold Path perfectly, I strive to. I pray for that. I med. Dash. I take every morning with a wise friend and lately I've been using healing meditations because I have chronic pain and it's been helpful. Please don't let me leave you with the impression that this crack dash tice is easy because it's not. I used to avoid feeling and now I feel every dash thing. I've learned that when stuff comes up I just let it play out. Some dash times you need to just let the record play. I have a record that was chiseled into my body and there's nothing I can do about that but I try and catch the feelings so I can identify if they're from past or present, if it's killed or shame. When my past pain haunts me I stop and breath slowly and chant. My favorite mantra, Om Ter Tadir Ture Soha, Jean. I started drinking at age 8 and within a few years, I was an expert on French wine. My father had died in a plane crash when I was 4, I drank up. Dash. Heard from a serious bout of spinal meningitis the same year leaving me with lifelong learning disabilities, and my mom acquired a female lover. When I was sick. So, really, why not turn to drinking? My drinking excel, dash, berated my senior year in high school, which became one long alcoholic. Blur. I was accepted to college in October of that year, so not a lot was required of me other than to be upright from time to time. My attraction to other girls was starting to emerge, and I drank in part to fit in, but mostly to numb those feelings. College took me to the University of Colorado Boulder in 1969. Please feel free to close your eyes and imagine just how crazy that time was pure LSD, incredible leap, psilocybin, 3.2 beer, we had it all plus a healthy dose of campus revolution. I'd gone from high school in a small town in New Hampshire to an epicenter of the zeitgeist. I was completely unprepared and found an immediate escape in drugs and alcohol. My Grades 
suffered and eventually I dropped out. I did finally own my sex suit. Dash. Alavian found a short-lived romantic relationship that set the stage for the series of loving, albeit disastrous relationships to come. At 26, I left behind an epically poor performance as a teacher of kids with developmental disabilities and headed to Arkasandi, a visionary architectural and environmental project emerging in the Arizona desert. Armed with an unemployment paycheck from the state of Illinois and no construction skills whatsoever, I became a dishwasher, rebar manager, electrician, bronze foundry worker, and community networker. In my spare time, I was, of course, a village bartender and drug supplier. At Arkasandi, I found both my purpose and my people. We were a bunch of misfits and idealists. A clown car come to life on a daily basis. My partner at the time and I left Arkasandi in 1980 with every dash. Thing we owned an RVW bus. We landed in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Dash. Sets and started focusing on work and school. I became a daily blackout. Drinker. Sexually promiscuous and emotionally abusive. I hated myself. And I still didn't stop. Finally, the relationship ended in my former part. Dash. NER stopped any form of communication with me for 13 years. I had earned every one of those years. My last drink was NyQuil on July 4, 1986. Or at least I think it was 1986. It's been a while, but I'm sure it was July 4. I was lonely in somebody else's house and looking for some kind of relief from anything at all. I'd been to a few 12-step meetings but thoroughly resisted the idea that I belonged with people who couldn't handle their drinking. That just seemed ridiculous to me, and evidence of a complete failure of will. But I woke up on July 5th and took in the reality that I'd been reduced to someone who drank NyQuil to get high. At that moment, I lost any interest in drinking again and it never came back. I'd lost almost everything. My partner, my home, my self-respect. I literally had no off. Dash. Tie-ons but to start building a sense of self and doing the work to begin. Living with integrity, self-respect, and care. I trundled along with the 12 steps for many years. I did all the stuff. 90 meetings in 90 days. Sponsors. Social life built around people. I would met an Alcoholics Anonymous learning to make really bad copy in church basements and turning my life over to well what my standing 12-step joke is that i never drank again because i didn't have the energy to get sober again i tried everything to get my mind around the idea of a higher power whether that meant the group the table, or some other random object. One night, seven years into all of this, I was at a meeting and someone from out of town dropped in. She started talking about the spur. Dash. It was in and the concept of being spirited, honoring and cherishing that quality of spiritedness. I never saw her again. But that night I quit pondering the meaning of higher power and started owning my spirited dash ness. 
From that day forward, I became a person in recovery. It took a few more years to conduct a searching and fearless moral inventory, because language like that makes me want to hide on dash under the bed, not actually do anything self-reflective. But one afternoon, while treading water in a pool in Bethesda, Maryland, I downloaded all my sins to a very nice woman who was serving as my sponsor and she let me know that I got off easy. My track record didn't feel easy to me. But her saying that in such a kind and generous way gave me the emo dash tional space to keep going in recovery. This same sponsor encouraged me to get inpatient treatment for the history of alcoholism in my family. I'm a third generation alcohol. Dash. I see. I spent a week at a facility that uses psychodrama and other intense group-oriented therapeutic tools to dig into the mess that was my family and get an understanding of how to end the destructive patterns I had. Absorbed as a child, I left there feeling free for the first time in my life. Not surprisingly, it was during this period, at about 12 years sober, that I met the woman, Anna, who I'd go on to marry and live with for 24 years. Several years into our relationship, Anna and I started looking for meditation teachers. We spent numerous weekends at Brightonbush. Our local retreat center in the Oregon Cascades, field testing various specimens. Some of them were boring, some authentically annoying, and some bordering on creepy. I'd seen Noah Levine's profile in the Brighton Dash Bush brochure for several years. He looked a little dangerous but interest. Dash so we signed up for a week with him one summer. Within an hour of listening to him, Anna and I looked at each other and knew we found our teacher. Noah's practice community was based in Los Angeles, with against the stream serving as his hub organization. I embraced Dharma with a vengeance. I did retreats, listened to Endless podcasts by Theravadan teachers such as John Peacock, Christina Feldman, Gil Fransville and others. Noah offered a year-long book study course co-taught by Matthew Brensilver and so we made the quarterly trek to Los Angeles. I went to Noah's against the stream events and love both the practice and the community. I was initially not excited about Refuge Recovery, the Buddhist adjacent recovery program Noah DeBell. Dash. Oaked with community members from against the stream, but Evan to Dash. Ally came around to the idea of a Buddhist based program that flipped the disease model of alcoholism on its tiny little head. Refuge Recovery. Annual conferences were a celebration of resilience and hope. The calm, dash, unity was thriving and, a couple of years in, I took over from Dave Smith as executive director. Twelve steps saved my life, Dharma study and, practice gave me a life worth living. I'd heard Noah say that, Sooner or later you will lose everything. But I didn't think it would ever apply to against the stream. But that's X. Dash. Actually what happened. Things fell apart and some handled it skillfully. And. Some did not. Along with Amy. Dirk. Dan. Don. Gary. Jessica. Matthew. 
and Paul and countless others, we started building Recovery Dharma. We wanted to be intentional in our framework. It had to be peer-led and trauma-informed. It had to have a book that was driven by Dharma. A volunteer from Austin put together a website for us in a week. We were intense and focused and more than a little obsessed. Even though the reality of the need for recovery dharma came at much personal loss. For some of us, building recovery dharma was almost always pure joy. And a whole lot of anarchy. I'll never forget the day Paul went live with the Facebook page. He was in Vermont and I was in Oregon and we were texting each other non-stop as the numbers grew. Recovery Dharma was driven by love, not always perfect but always steadfast. I am humbled to witness the growth of our program and all of the people who have put so much faith and care into it. We now have over 10,000 people in our main Facebook group and new folks are stepping in every day to be of service. RD has grown from the same five people doing everything to the point that I don't know half the board nor most of our Facebook admin. Dash. Ice traders. It's incredibly gratifying to see our program unfold in such an authentic and inspiring way. At 36 or so years into recovery, I continue to enjoy the benefits of the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. Dharma teachings and Sangha have enabled me to look at each day as an opportunity to live with intention and compassion, I've experienced the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows in recovery, and Dharma practice has helped me navigate it all with some measure of self-compassion and equanimity. Imperma Dash Mens is a part of life and the work I've done has enabled me to navigate it while acknowledging the suffering it can bring. I'm at Arcasanti as I write this, wind bells and birds everywhere. I'm not sure what life is going to bring next but I feel hopeful that Dharma study and practice will give me the strong back and soft front, taught by Zen Buddhist Roshi Joan. Halifax. Recovery is for the fearless amongst us who are equally willing to explore the tenderness and vulnerability of the human experience. X. Dash. Experiencing recovery in community has given me a sense of wholeness and love that I couldn't have found on my own. I am indebted to all who share their practice and gifts in our Sangha. Destiny. My brain has blocked out a lot of memories from early child. Dash. Put. I suppose this repression is some sort of self-defense mechanism. What I do remember is feeling isolated. I never really had much emo. Dash. Tional support. For most of my life, my mom has struggled with drugs. Addiction and my dad has been in prison. My mom and I lived with my grandparents in a small town in the middle of nowhere. It was a home riddled with dysfunction and codependency because I lacked under dash standing of the world and coping skills. I thought I was inadequate and incapable of dealing with life. I remember feeling forgotten, overlooked, alone, and scared. The town we lived in was predominantly Caucasian and partially racist. I am biracial and I struggled to fit in the small country town. I felt like I was too black for the white kids and too white for the black kids. I 
was also very creative, diverse, and a little eccentric. All the other kids in my school had little cliques, but I never felt genuinely included. By sixth grade, I was self-harming to feel in control of my pain. After having an emotional episode in late middle school, I was prescribed Xanax for a short period. For the first time in my life, I felt like I could disconnect from my harsh reality and relax in my own skin. After the doctor cut me off, I continually found other ways to get Xanax. In high school, I became friends with another attractive outcast who liked to use pills, marijuana, and alcohol just as much as me. She was my partner in crime. For once, I felt seen and understood. I also started getting into toxic relationships as I searched for love, attention, and affection in all the wrong places. Even though I got good grades, I skipped so much school that I had to drop out. I got my GED shortly AF. Dash. Tear. After turning 19, I went to a strip club where I found myself inspired by a dancer and infatuated with the lifestyle. Being an exotic dancer was like being a comedian, therapist, and actress simultaneously. My regulars loved me because I would listen deeply to them. At the same time, my intentions were insincere. I only listened to them with the condition of being paid for my time. For the most part, the relationships with my customers were artificial and developed through manipulation, but ultimately the person I hurt the most was myself. I was getting deeper and deeper into my drug addiction. I was also addicted to the fast-paced lifestyle and external validation. I was modeling too, and I became attached to the idea I was only worthy if I was desired by others. I was also in a very long and unhealthy relationship with a person who abused me physically and emotionally. Eventually, I went to jail a couple times for possession. One time was on the 4th of July. I remember watching the fireworks in the county jail through a tiny window behind the bars of my cell. How ironic, I thought to myself. Later that night, I started going through withdrawals. In the holding cell, another inmate told me that I was addicted and me. Dash. Ed to get help. As my mind spun out and my body shut down, it honestly never occurred to me that she might be right. When my abusive relationship ended, I spiraled deeper into ad. Dash. Addiction. To avoid feeling alone and unwanted, I latched onto a young man I found attractive. We went to a flop house one day looking for drugs. I looked around at the squalor the squatters were living in. How could they live like this? It looked like it had never been cleaned in. Someone had ripped all the wires out of the walls. However, after my first Hit of meth moments later, I moved in with them, and I didn't leave for a while. I was waitressing at the strip club, so I had plenty of money to support my habit. I lost 60 pounds in two months. I also temporarily lost my mind. At the time I went to my first 12-step meeting, I was back at my grandparents, with no bedroom to call my own, and pregnant. The 
Meetings were the only place that I felt safe. I finally started to gain some understanding about my addiction. I would go to the meetings and just word vomit while sharing around the tables. After relating to other men, dash, furs, I was desperate to turn my life around, so I cast a magic spell for a new beginning. The universe must have had a sense of humor because it promptly burned my grandma's house down. We lost everything. In some ways though, it was the best thing that could have happened. Dash. Penned, I relapsed very briefly and went back to meetings where I got a sponsor and started working the steps for my first time. I made a promise to myself. I decided to dedicate my life to healing myself and others. I vowed to be there for my daughter when she was born. I completed my court-ordered probation and monitoring. Then, around eight months into my recovery, after giving birth to my daughter and getting custody of my younger sister, I tried to go to my mom's apart. Dash meant to take her some groceries. My mom was still using her apartment. It was a mess with squatters coming and going. The scene was permeated with utter despair. Yet, I remember feeling jealous of her, that she could live like this, without a care. I had a brief relapse a couple days later. The vivid image of my mother in those deplorable conditions was a wound that I could not hold space for. I recommitted to healing. I had finally realized I wanted out of the self-destructive cycle of addiction. I sought help from a therapist. I went back to the 12-step meetings. I reconnected with my sponsor. Add, dash. Additionally, I began meditating and learning to sit with myself. I used to say my addiction was preying on me, telling me lies. Had I been more aware, I would have been able to identify that scene. For what it really was, misery. I would have been able to understand that I was not seeing clearly. Awareness would have allowed me to better understand reality, to reach out to someone for help, and to be there for myself instead of turning on myself and running from the discomfort. Awareness could have saved me from shooting the painful second arrow. Soon, I would gain new awareness and understanding through the addition of recovery dharma to my program. During the COVID-19 pandemic, I started attending road meetings online. I found this sangha in Birmingham, Alabama that was hosting multiple meetings a week. I quickly became a regular and beloved member of the Sangha even though I lived thousands of miles away. I cultivated a network of wise friends who I could check in with and talk to when I felt emotionally distressed. The road program made me a more self-compassionate person as well as a more mindful mother and friend. Meditation really changed my life for the better. I find it interesting whenever I see where my mind has gone. Sometimes I laugh at myself. I can focus on the sound of my breath or where I feel the sensation of breath the most. I can label my thoughts as thinking, reminding myself, oh, this is my critical mind, and letting the thoughts pass naturally like a cloud passing over me through a bright blue sky. My practice has taught me that, no matter how distressed, I become